What happens when two bass road warriors spend quality time talking music and life with one of their peers? Bassist educator author David C. Gross and bassist and head honcho of KnowYourBassPlayer.com, Tom Semioli, trade eights with the legends of rock, jazz, funk, blues, folk, country, and more. Notes from an artist, revealing conversations with the legends who've created the soundtrack of our lives. What happens? You're about to find out. It's another episode of Notes from an Artist. Our guest is jazz saxophonist Daniel Stevens. His new album is entitled Closer Than We Think. You can purchase a download or stream Daniel's new album starting April 5th, 2024. It is out on Cellar Music Group, C-E-L-L-A-R. Now, David, the theme of Dana's new record is musical unity, and let me quote him from his press release, Closer Than We Think is taken from the idea of seeking similarity as humans rather than harping and dividing on ourselves among the myriad of divisions upon which society seems to constantly fixate. The band, with its scattered origins and generational gaps, provides a living metaphor for the beauty that can be achieved when we as a species focus on the unity of collaboration and view our differences as strength. Good idea, I say. I think it's great. As a matter of fact, I was having a conversation yesterday and I said, guess what? If I gave you a knife and you cut yourself and I grabbed the knife and cut myself, guess what? We'd all bleed red. There you go. You say tomato and I say potato. See, we're all the same. Well, that's just because I'm well read. You're not. My gal is red hot. Your gal ain't doodle as hell. There we go. So Dana Stevens is our guest tonight. Let's get on with the platform plugs and then we'll talk about the playlist. You, the audience member, may be listening to David and myself every Monday night on Cygnus Internet Radio, C-Y-G-N-U-S. You dial that up on the internet browser of your choice www.cygnusradio.com You, the audience member, and who is that audience member, David? Her name's Karen. Karen. Maybe listening to us on our Notes from an Artist podcast, which is streaming right this very moment on Apple, Amazon, Buzzsprout, Spotify, and wherever podcasts are potted. And David, did you know you can go behind the scenes with Notes from an Artist on our Notes from an Artist YouTube page? My only question is, why would you? When you do, don't forget to subscribe and be sure to log on to www.notesfromanartist.com to keep up with whatever we're doing at any given time. David, let's talk about the Dana Stevens playlist, which comes on directly after the interview. Oh, I think you guys are going to love this. The first four or five songs are really influences of Dana's. The first one is God Bless the Child, the Eric Dolphy tune that he did solo on his bass clarinet. We then go to John Coltrane with Mr. PC. And what's interesting about it, and I'll do a plug for another record, Evenings at the Village Vanguard, which is a great album with both John and Eric playing together when they were both part of John Coltrane's band. Third tune is actually an interesting version of Jaco Pistorius's Three Views of a Secret because it's actually Jaco on piano and Mr. Toots Steelman on harmonica. Although it's really hard to say Toots plays a harmonica. I mean, it's so much more in his capable hands. It truly is. And then we do Charles Mingus's I Can't Get Started, which is a phenomenal track off of Charles's Mingus on Piano record. And lastly, of essential influences is a Ewe tune or ooey tune, Bob Mincer and Yellow Jackets called One Day. Then we get into the meat and the potatoes. Not that they were into complex carbs or anything. We start with Dana Stevens from a solo album, and it's called Contagious, that tune. It's a great tune. We then have Linda O, oh, another bass player. Oh, my. And her tune is Ultimate Persona. It's a great track. And this next Dana Stevens song, you notice how I, Tom, it's a Dana nice. tune and someone else that Dana plays with, another Dana tune. This is called Wicked Sweet, which I guess is a, a tune that he co-wrote with Tweety Bird. I thought I saw a pretty cat. Followed by another great album called Pluto Juice, which is a Canadian band. This is the tune. You see the connection between the Yui. It's Dana playing it as well. Great track. It's called Welcome to the Snow Globe. Then we have Dana doing another tune called Peace. We have one track. It's a really interesting track by Matt Slocum called Black Elk's Dream. Now, a couple things about this. As you know, when you're not listening on CygnusRadio.com, you're listening on one of the podcast sites, and we always have a playlist. Unfortunately, 
title music where our playlists are played is not there. So I suggest you go to YouTube and grab Black Elk's Dream. The next track is another song where Dana plays beautifully. It's a song called Concentric Circles by Kenny Barron. Next up is Al Foster, the great drummer, a tune called Douglas. And our last track is a Dana Stevens tune from his brand new record, and it's called Bubbly. So let's toast with a bit of the bubbly to Mr. Dana Stevens. We want to thank him for being on the show. And please purchase his records. He's a great artist. Go see him live. And we'll see you on the other side of the interview. Right, Tom? Absolutely. Bring in Dana Stevens. Our guest, he's Dana Stevens. He is a saxophonist, composer, arranger, educator, a recording and performing artist. Did you know, David, that in 2019, Daniel won the Downbeat Critics Poll for Rising Star and Tenor Saxophone? Now, Dana, is that like being Rookie of the Year for Sports Illustrated or something? <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How did that change your life? <laughs> well, sorry. you know, people start buying some records. So yeah. Okay. It's a <laughs> no, good thing. It's, no, it's a good thing. It was, it was obviously an honor. The magazine's been around for a long time. But um, yeah, no, I, th I think it, it helped get, get my name out there. I get a lot more attention from the jazz media, I guess you would say. <laughs> yeah, well, it's hard yeah. now because the media is so fragmented. But the beautiful yeah. thing about Downbeat, and Downbeat, if you're listening, David and I are available for a podcast. Downbeat is going 80 years strong. And it's still a yeah, thick magazine uh, with lots of advertising. And if yeah. you want to learn about jazz, you read Downbeat Magazine. That's right. As a matter of fact, oh, I guess about 35 years ago, I contacted Downbeat because they wanted me to do a one of those workshop columns. Mm. And yeah. So I said, how about I transcribe God Bless the Child by Eric Dolphy and then Ooh. go about it? And they liked it. And then I halfway through it, I go, what if I take motifs from God Bless the Child and then educate people on, well, if you take this motif, you can do this to it, this to it, this to it. Mm -hmm. And so that was a long time ago. And frankly, I will never listen to God Bless the Child again. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Uh, that's what transcribing can do to you, yes. right? You yeah. cannot try this at home. Yes. It demystifies <laughs> everything. And you're like, okay. <laughs> now, now, Dana, you you uh, went to uh, Thelonious Monk Institute of Jazz, and you studied sure. with uh, Terrence Blanchard, Wayne Shorter, Herbie Hancock. Not a bad, um, not a bad staff of teachers. Uh, what do you, what do you learn from being around Ooh. icons like that? Oof. Oof. Uh, so. That, 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 uh, that, that could be a very long answer. Let me, let me just try to direct it here. It depends on who you're talking about, really, because those are three very unique, yes, they are. distinct personalities. I got a lot of compositional knowledge from Terrence, obviously. Just a lot of the drills he would give us in terms of writing, you know, like a 30-minute timer just to get to an end of a tune or mm -hmm. uh, how to develop a motif in multiple different ways, writing about a particular narrative or, or not, really. Wayne, just... Like, Getting a chance to see him arrange a tune that was written by our trombonist at the time, Nick Vianas, was quite a lesson in itself. And to, to see him actually, no, not messing with the melody, but but searching for different sounds that can go underneath that particular melody that was already written, and what ended up being the new harmony for that <laughs> for that bridge, clearly was quite fascinating. It was like a, a kid discovering <laughs> some new toy or something. It was, and Herbie's, well, another extreme master, but we had a chance to perform with him in, in Paris in November, 2002. Needless to say, I haven't played with anyone with such huge ears and the ability of the, the comp almost, <laughs> what what he was throwing back in between the space was quite overwhelming for me in a moment because it was, it was obviously related to what was happening, but it, it was so inventive and, and rhythmically interesting and harmonically. I, I was just, I was, uh, I was almost stunned into silence, to be honest, in the moment, because it was such a masterful experience. I mean, it was, it was a masterful, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how, how. Whenever you see interviews or read interviews with Herbie Hancock, and he talks about the legendary Miles Davis ensemble, that's the first thing he mentioned is what amazing listeners everybody was, Ron Carter, yeah. and Williams, et cetera. And then that yeah. was the key to their success, really, their ability to listen to each other. Yeah. While still being super supportive and not, hmm. not yeah, yeah, yeah. The ears are just, just, just huge, and the attention to every little detail wasn't big ears. You big just ears. Feel the, the, and you went the to sense. you went to Berkeley College, 
of music in Boston. David, you went to Berkeley. That's true. <laughs> Don't hold it against me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You survived Berkeley. And you teach yeah. at the Manhattan School of Music and William Patterson. Yeah. Let's talk about education to kick off. I mean, it's well, such wait a, a different second. world. Tom, Tom I, I do want to talk about education. You but do. I want to go back to, to Dana's other Berkeley. And did you study with oh, Phil? Right. Phil Hardman. No, he was before my time, but I didn't know him. He was before your yeah. time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All the teachers that I studied with studied with Phil. And Phil did come back to the high school a couple of times when I was there. But I was under Charles Hamilton at that time. He was the second okay. director after. Sure. Well, I, yeah. I have a number of friends who studied with Phil. Steve oh, Bernstein, cool. you must know. Oh, yeah. Of course, I know Steve. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Will Bernard. Yeah. I actually just talked to Will a couple of days ago. Yeah. Okay. So so they they were just, they lionized this guy. And uh, huge for education. We can go down that whole rabbit hole as well. But a lot of lot of folks have praised his, his knowledge for good reason. Well, getting back to education, it's got to be challenging in this time now. I went to the University of Miami many years ago. They're jazz oh, cool. School. At the time, the curriculum was focused on bebop. And this is the age of Weather Report, George Benson, and Spyro Gyra. Now, in music education, you're competing against YouTube tutorials and all sorts of right. other things. We had Ron Carter on talking about chartography. He really maintains that you teach yourself and the most a, a teacher can do is really point you in the right direction. What What is your approach as an educator given all the information that's out there and a lot of it kind of misinformative. Yeah. Well, I mirror that approach. I give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, you know the whole the whole sign. Right. I definitely follow that approach. I learned from a lot of great teachers myself from high school. Well, even from pre before high school. I don't know if you guys mm -hmm. know this, Norbert Stachel and not it's a great saxophone player from the Bay Area. He played played with Prince but now he's living here in the in the East Coast. I'm always giving knowledge with the aim of it being interpreted with the with the student's voice. So I'll give them some stuff about what to play, pentatonic or what have you. It's a whole bunch of different what's. But the how is them. And I really express about all the different ways of how to, to play a particular set of notes or a particular concept or whatever. And I am very deliberate when I'm going back and forth between the two. I make sure that's that's known. This exercise is, God forbid, please don't play this on stage in front of people exactly <laughs> note for note. Please put some kind of personality into it. And maybe to explore all the possibilities, just go the get rid of all the hows and start from scratch. And really, how do I want to express this vibrato? How do I want to express my time feel ahead or behind the beat? How do I want to express the dynamics? How do I want to start the note? How do I want to end the note? Really go back to all the little pieces that make up a whole big, complicated, emotional hmm. story with sound. Yeah, and we, you know, we all have our influences, but and they'll never leave us usually. Sure. You know, we'll always be able to go back to that, but find a lot of growth when people just kind of drip down and really work on the little individual elements. This is something I learned. I don't know if you guys have, I imagine you've come across Hal Crook at some point across the years. So I, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm a disciple of his teaching. And it's all about really just breaking down everything granular, granularly, if you will. And with that, I also really focus on composing. I think that's huge. When I play Mr. PC, it's kind of hard not to think of train. You know what I mean? Right. Or you, you play Teen Towns, like, okay. Right, right. <laughs> But when you write a song, you are that first original version. You know, it, yeah. it's a, it's an expressed path into, I think, one's own playing. So all my private students, that's the first thing we get into. We have the whole list of tunes uh, or, or, or concept in writing songs that we, we go through, starting with like uh, a contrafact, which really focusing on melody with an existing right. set of changes, and then focusing on how to dress a already given melody. So then we do a rearm, and then we'll start with just writing the melody to a, writing an, an idea, a melody from beginning to end and seeing what you do with, you know, just all these different ways of writing. There's all you, but the different perspective and a different approach gives you unique voices of your, of your own, of your same creativity. So Interesting. you're absolutely then, right. You're yeah. You really are. And you think a few of the interviews we've had recently, we've spoken about Jocko. And, and Mingus and Charles Mingus as well. Yeah. Right. I was going there too. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> Tom. And how for most of their lives, people thought of them as bass players. And Jocko in particular, one of the things that's overlooked in I think maybe 10, 15, 20 years down the line, it'll, his bass playing, as, as amazing as it was, 
would not have happened if he didn't write Three Views of a Secret, <laughs> if he didn't write Portrait of Tracy. And same thing with Mingus. Both of them, incidentally, it would, it just popped into my head, their keyboard skills were, mm. were incredible. You know, you see um, Jocko with Toots or that great uh, Mingus record where all he does is play piano. <laughs> it's it's yeah. just this this brilliant stuff and yeah. really i know for them and i and i know for me and and when when you compose it changes how you play from that moment on everything you do it's yeah. completely different when i was yeah. at berkeley i was studying with Monacus and oh yeah oh man and charlie would give you these exercises and he said, okay, now you have to do this in all keys and you have to write four bar phrases where no two notes are next to each other. So you have to do these <laughs> octave things and, and all this. And it was great. And once again, when you think of Dolphy, because Dolphy is like one of mm, my mm. Uh, personal idols, particularly on bass clarinet, the, the octave jumps, the all these incredible things. I, even, even Youssef Latif talks about that in his repository about all these synthetic scales that Dolphy was doing. But it's just an amazing thing how it changes your entire approach by just writing a damn song. Yeah. And it also reveals your unique personal preferences, it just lays them all out on the table. I mean, you just see it all there. And we all know improvisation and composition are really just two sides of the same coin. Yeah. Minus the ability, the ability to edit is the, really the, the main difference. Immediately starts leaking into their improvisation as a player. Yeah, man. I wish I had a chance to play with, with Charlie. I, I had one correspondence with him not long before he passed. We were, we were, we're getting ready to, to start the He was the such an and, inspiration, you know. a very up man. And he knew things that just no one knew. It was, it was like mm. Lenny Tristano for the, uh, the 70s, mm. 60s, 70s, and 80s. Are just, just brilliant, brilliant stuff. Mm. One of the other things that must be a challenge as an educator, and uh, Marcus Miller was talking about this on his Sirius XM show, Miller Time, is that many of his mm. students came to the instrument playing along with a computer, playing along with tracks on YouTube, and they have problems playing with real people <laughs> because real people don't do the same thing twice. Do you find that with young students? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what? It's funny. I don't find that. I, I'm, this might be an interesting little path we go on. I actually, since I only really learned playing with musicians, I actually kind of enjoy playing with the with the machine. I enjoy trying to make it sound music or you know bringing musicality to this dead machine. But most of my students really don't like playing with whatever the apps we'll call them. Right. Okay. Right interesting. Interesting. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I find that I am almost trying to encourage them to to meet the challenge of trying to make music with it. Well, I find it, you know, obviously it's probably a thousand times better playing with humans, but... Well, that all depends on the human. It depends. But they're also, they're... they're, they're, they're <laughs> We're working in a world now, a, post, a post-COVID world of remote recording, okay? So right. that's right. a big, big difference than being at the session with the guy, everybody in the studio looking at each other. And when you get a track on e via email... That's essentially playing with a computer. There's nobody to react off of. It's true. And yeah. I, I find it extremely, I'm imagining you guys have talked about this a, a bunch before, but I find it really hard to do remote recording. Yeah. Very, very hard. I, I, mean, I kind of get perfectionist about it. And I'm like, the ability just knowing you can be like, okay, let me do that over again. That's Lord have mercy. The pressure of having to do one take or two takes or three takes in the studio just kind of gets to the point and then all buttoned up and fine. It's great. For some reason, that element of uh, of being able to, to go back and redo it or, or bring out the worst in my creativity, honestly. Yeah, it, it, it is difficult, uh, but of, of course, it's an economic fact of life. It's obviously easier to yeah. do it and recording studios are going out of business. I mean, it's it's yeah, very interesting. Yeah. You can almost trace this back to Pro Tools because with yeah. before Pro mm. Tools, you had to be a proficient musician because tape wore out. So you had to get your take mm. first or second take. You had to nail it. And now in with in the Pro Tools world, which is now thirty years old or more than that, it's all cut and paste, and you don't really have to play. <laughs> you yeah. just program it. So it seems like yeah. now it's it, the, the ante's been up with with uh, remote recording. Which, gosh, David, most of the people we talk about that made their records, some of them never even met each other. Well, true. Yeah. Well, you and I both were using an abacus, so you know it, it <laughs> yes, really uh, <laughs> definitely goes back away. You know. <laughs> what are some of the new projects you're working on that you're excited about? 
Well, speaking of recording, I'm actually, well, my pandemic instrument was the mixing station I have here. Okay. I've been recording. I bought a few mics and I'm really getting into mixing and, and dabbling in some mastering. I'm, I'm just a whole different side of, of the transfer of music that I just never really did a deep dive into. And I'm completely obsessed about it right now. Talking to different, you know, recording engineers of had a conversation or two with James Farber and Chris Allen. I don't know if you guys know Chris Allen or not, but he's so. um, recorded. Yeah, Chris is well, well, he started off as James' assistant, God, probably 15 or more years ago. And he works at Sears. He's the other engineer uh, at, at Sears Sound in New York. So I've been doing a lot of that, but also I've uh, got about three or four recordings in the can. Well, the one that's coming out the soonest, I, I should say, is called Closer Than We Think, features a young guitarist. I met actually a, a student of mine at MSM. His name is Emmanuel Michael, brilliant guitar player, really soulful, has his own unique sense of time and, and harmony and melody and sound. And in the guitar world, it's, it's a lot of amazing influences leaked heavily into the young guitar world. But this, this guy really stands out as a unique voice, I feel. And JK Kim's a drummer from South Korea, another really awesome, awesome drummer, also a Berkeley grad, and Kanoa Men Mendenhall. Noah is a great young bassist from the Bay Area. You may know her from some Joel Ross records. She's a, okay. Joel Ross is a great young vib vibraphonist. And uh, I knew her, you know, when she was a kid over in, in, in the Bay Area. And she's just a really, really great bass player, super solid and, and really supportive and, and um, really like her solos. I mean, she, she says a lot without saying a lot. Mm. <laughs> you know mm. what I mean? Tough to so, do. Yeah, it's up to do. Really, really <laughs> mature. We recorded a record back in May. It's going to come out on Cellar, Cellar Jazz in April, but this first single comes out in, at the end of January. Okay. Second single, beginning of March. So, yeah, that's the next project. But I've got, again, like I said, I've got some in the can. I did a bass record. I recorded a bass record at Rudy Van Gelder's in March of what was that, 22, I think it was. And um, it's mixed and mastered and kind of ready to go, but I, I'm just, I don't want to put them all out at once. <laughs> And then the quartet that I you know, I did a record live in the Vanguard in, in 2019 that came out in 2020. Weird year to release anything. And that band, we actually, the next time we played in the Vanguard, we went into the studio and did a studio recording, which ended up kind of being two records. But but that's a great, great recording. I started sending it to people before I even contacted you. I said, you got to check this oh, out. Yeah. Plus, I that, I, I, yeah, we got to talk about Pluto Juice for just a second. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's great. Ewe. I mean, come on. Who's doing Ewe right now, right? Not enough people, I'll tell you that. Oh, oh. <laughs> not enough, man. <laughs> yeah. No, I love Pluto Juice. Uh, yeah, I'm imagining you know Rich Brown, uh -huh. um, electric bass player up in yeah. Toronto. Yeah, it was a real treat to play with him. But yeah, man, no, I've, uh, I've actually. I was introduced to the Ely by Bob Minter when I was in high school. He were playing at the Monterey Jazz Festival. And it was just a sound check. They were just warming up. And he just did the thing where he went from way to the top, all the way to the bottom. And I was like, my mouth was on the floor. I was like, what? this is 97. So this is, this is quite, you know, quite a few years ago. And I, I, I immediately knew I need this thing. I didn't know how it was going to happen. But <laughs> <laughs> when I got to Berkeley, uh, they had a class and I took the class. Still didn't get my own until uh, 2007 and was still a little bit intimidated by, by it, honestly. It's really such sensitive and it's very connected to your senses a, a lot more than the saxophone, which is more of a mechanical, you feel kind of a, a device where the EW is just really connected to every little thing you do. So it took me a good five years to feel comfortable to bring it out of the house, to be honest. Once you get used to it, it's exhilarating is all I can say. Sure. The sure. Power that and if you has. think about it, you go back to Eddie Harris when he was using that octave oh, box. Right. And then all of a sudden, Tom, we, we can always look at first the guitar had the distortion box. That was yeah. like the first thing. Then came chorus pedals, delays, this, that, and the other. Lange. Thing. Oh, yeah. players started using that. Yeah. Keyboard players, then came the Fender Rhodes, the Wurlitzer, synthesizers. About time they gave the saxophone something, right? <laughs> <laughs> Here, well, go to the corner. Here, take that electric instrument and blow. <laughs> well, look at all the trouble Miles got in with a Wawa, right? Everybody, the jazz belief. Exactly. Oh, man. oh, man. That music's coming yeah. back. Or maybe it hasn't left. It hasn't left it. Well, well, let me ask you, yeah. Dana, you know, we're talking about records, these wonderful collections of songs. We live in an age of streaming. What are your thoughts? Is, yeah. is, the, is the album format, this is a question we asked everyone from Ron Carter to Rudy Sarzo with uh, Ozzy Osbourne, is the album format 
Mm. Still relevant in the 21st century, 2024? I think those of us who grew up listening to music in that format will always mm -hmm. probably somewhat favor that format. And I may be the tail end of that gener of that of that group of people, but I think it's going to be different for this young generation now. Okay. I, I, probably countless records where you hear a song and then when it ends, you can already hear the next song. In the oh, right absolutely. Yeah, it comes. Yeah. I don't know when anyone, well, none of my students have that experience as far as I've Mm -hmm. surveyed <laughs> yeah that makes sense. you know so and they're and they're great like geez i mean my students i mean i have one of them in my band i'm picking them off as fast as i can here like they're, they're not it's not affecting their talent and their ability to express themselves and to write with with a unique voice so it's just it's just a different delivery system a different it's a different thing man we've got a car now on the horse and buggy uh yeah well look so here uh, i am okay there's dana uh -oh. on uh, Spotify. And these are your most popular tracks here. Uh, Destinesia. Oh, I know these things. Destinesia, oh. Lesson One, Isfahan, mm -hmm. Emil. Did I pronounce that right? Oh, Emily. Yeah. Emily, okay. See, David, I'm I'm the Norman uh, Crosby. Uh, of, uh, Tom is really a problem with um, reading. And, I get misconstrued. <laughs> it's difficult to have a radio show with somebody like that, but they're the handicapped, you know. Yes, well, my eyes are going bad, so I need to see an optimist. So anyway... <laughs> <laughs> okay, and your other track is uh, I Left My Heart in San Francisco. Now, do you feel that, okay, uh, so I hear this guy, Dana Stevens, I'm going to check this guy out on my Spotify. Do you think that's representative of what you do? Well, the first one, not even my record. Okay. I'm actually embarrassed, but I need to listen to that record all the way through. <laughs> I haven't even listened to it all the way through yet. But it was something I, actually, that was a fell on the on the whole production of that record, but it was one of the remote things that I did. Okay. I actually really enjoyed that one. I even played some bass clarinet, I think, on a couple tracks on that. And I really, the, the, especially the songs that I, I remember working on, I'm, I'm really, I like with those guys. I feel my, my range, my taste range is pretty, pretty wide, but not as deep as I like, but it is wide taste-wise. I don't know, man. Yeah, I think all the other ones are pretty, maybe pretty representative, but I think the, the new record is going to be, I think, going to be a little bit different than that, though. Okay. It's a texture, texture wise, only having guitar with no piano. And the songs that we chose to do, like only, I only wrote two or three songs on this record. A lot of them are songs from, like, ones of Julian Laws. I don't know if you guys know Julian Laws or not. But oh, yeah. Yeah. Good, good, good friend of mine. As a matter of fact, I wanted to talk kid. to you. You talk about Emmanuel as this really young, up and coming guitarist, but. If you think about it, it's almost and I'm and this isn't a criticism. I, I I'm actually digging it. It seems like everyone's taken Bill Frizzell and have decided mm. look at well, Mary Haverson, who was studying with uh, Braxton. She's using mm. a lot of these effects in a similar fashion. Julian, of course. If you listen to the new record, the record starts with backwards guitar. And now you can oh, do that know. live. So it, it makes it even cooler. And then obviously you're talking about Emmanuel, you're, you're a guitar player. And there seems to be something going on with guitar that it's almost like the, uh, the I guess the Mike Stearns, the Wayne Krantz is the last, let's say, big guitar players in jazz. Then Frizzell came along, just threw all the rules out, and, and all of a sudden, <laughs> hey, look at all these great effects. Something new is definitely coming on the guitar scene, I think, in jazz. Yeah, well, you've yeah, had so many yeah, guitar sure. players who grew up on rock guitar players who all use effects. So that's just natural. It's like well, I remember Stanley and Jocko came on the scene. I'm that old. Yes, David. They were influenced. Stanley Clark was from Philadelphia. So he loved Philly soul. And mm. you could hear that in his playing. Mm. Jocko liked rock and roll. He grew up during the, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. So you could see Jocko had a little bit of that in him. But what's interesting, getting back to the record format just for a second, we spoke to yeah. uh, Guy Pratt, who is a famous is a UK session player. That's him with Madonna on Like a Prayer, David Gilmore, Brian Ferry. His son is a musician. His son is 21 years old. And he's saying that the preferred format of young people nowadays is the EP. Back in the 60s and 70s, the EP was a 45 with two extra songs on it. But now it's just considered mm -hmm. four songs. You think maybe that's a way to present your music to a jazz public that is very fickle. And that's Streaming. Like, for example, this is what, when, when they hear Dana Stevens, that's what they think of you. This is these top five tracks. Could that be a possible yeah. alternative you explore? I'm open to the direction that it will organically end up. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm, I'm into the falling wherever it's kind of naturally going. In, a, in other words, I've definitely been open to, actually, so these records I have in the, in the can, I'm actually think, considering how to maybe split it up in, in different ways. 
Hmm. And, and uh, the one's got like 13 tracks that could, could be three EPs. The same band, and there's enough tracks where some are with horns and some are just the quartet and some with guitar. You know, it could, it could be. I'm open to anything, really. Yeah. Well, you think you have to be. Sing a single you know? off your new album and jazz singles? What? <laughs> right, I know. That's 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 definitely a, a th- I mean, I think in the past year and a half, that's definitely starting to be more of a thing. Well, because um, it's reacting, and, it's know. a reaction to streaming. Well, the only constant is change, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Going back to your experience as an engineer now, do you have a new fan respect for these people who sit on the other side of the glass and <laughs> what they have to go through? Right. I worship. I worship these guys. <laughs> Seriously, I worship these guys at this moment. Dave Darlington. I already mentioned James Farber. I mean, there's this. Oh, yeah. I'm. I'm just going through a lot now. I'm doing. I'm basically doing what a lot of kids are doing today with with jazz. I'm just going down the tutorial rabbit hole and all these yeah. interviews. Al Schmidt. Oh my God, I learned so much from that guy. Less is more. It's so interesting how much overlap is in between the world in terms of creating the creating the art of it. Right. Or, you know, making it uh, making it what it is. It's, there was so much smothering I did in the beginning because I, you know, it's just kind of learning the tools and well, learning to listen to what the record wants versus what you're trying to make it be, which is like this or that. That's I mean, it's uh, l- allowing the song to be what it is versus trying to play a rock song over a jazz song or a jazz song over a rock song or whatever, you know, just trying mm-hmm. to give this piece of music its best light. And you can't blame the engineer for a bad take anymore now that you've been. <laughs> 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 and I will say, uh, I think, you, you know that I play bass as well, I'm guessing. Yes, I see one I in the back there. I see it over yeah. there. And, We've and, got you know, one. I was yeah. thinking, we're yeah. going to be out of work, Tom. This is, this is not good. <laughs> oh, no. You're cool. You're good. You're good. Uh-huh. No, I'd say 90% of my mixing stuff has been trying to figure out how to get the bass right. And when I talked to James Farber, this was about a month and a half ago, he was recording Bill Stewart live at the Vanguard. It's just it's the happenstance. I walked in, he's like, whoa, James, you're here. And uh, just sat with him for a half, you know, half an hour during the break and picked his brain. And he just said right away, it's like, if you spend more than five minutes on it, like, you just got to stop. <laughs> you know, I'm like, what? Yeah. Five minutes? You kidding me? It's been five months on this particular thing. <laughs> Get it right. And that just, like, sent up the light bulbs, man. They, they, sh- they shined really bright after that after that conversation. I was really trying to make this bass player sound like maybe another bit, you know. And it's like, no, let's uh, just bring out the best qualities of what it is. And just, yeah. And then after that, two or three hours, I'm done with a mix. And it's like, oh. That's what it. That's what it was. I was trying to over overthinking about it, just obsessing and perfectionizing. When it's yeah. Well, David and Mother, I have done bass it. duets, so I stand behind oh. him and look over his shoulder. And David, somebody just put up a YouTube of us this morning. We did a charity mm. concert for uh, Teen Camp uh, about two years ago mm. at the Cutting Room. Remember, David, and we were on stage playing. I think it was Get Back, the Beatles Get Back tune. I think. Yeah. Was. But David's bass is bigger than mine because he has six strings, so he gets most yeah. of the attention. You know, you just see me <laughs> hopping around behind him. Let's stop at the Vanguard for a second. Okay. One of our earliest interviews is somebody. Oh yes. Who- very well, Larry Grenadier. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, I saw that interview earlier this morning. Actually, I was checking yeah, it out. Yeah. But but what was yeah. interesting is he did a live during the pandemic solo at the Vanguard. Oh, right. Because right. he had released this incredible record called The Gleaners. ECM. What are you going to say? Yeah. You're always going to chase Ooh. that sound, and, and you know. Yeah. He was doing all this amazing stuff with that one microphone and mm. a pickup, and and the thing just sounded. Just incredible. The only complaint was no one was there. Right. It was hard to perform <laughs> yeah. without the reaction of an audience. But, you know, in that time, and this is the mm. pandemic, we spoke to both Larry Grenadier and we spoke to Colin Blunstone of the Zombies because they were doing the similar thing. They were doing a session from Abbey Road. One of the nice things for, in the Zombies case was that they want to bring an orchestra to do uh, Odyssey and Oracle, their famous psychedelic uh, uh, masterpiece there. And they can't do that on the road because it's not cost effective. But at Abbey Road, you can do that. And I think, what were they charging? $10 Ten a ticket? Bucks. Yeah, and bucks. the same thing with Larry Grenadier's concert from the solo concert from the Vanguard was beautiful. It was well lit. The sound was as you would expect at the Vanguard. And David and I were thinking, wow, this might be an alternative because, look, we all know it's ridiculous to travel now. It's so hard. It's so expensive. It's not cost effective anymore. My friend's coming off the road. They're not making any money. What about the virtual concert as maybe a hybrid platform between the recording 
in the actual in-person live performance. Yeah, I'm into that. I felt that COVID, one of the silver linings is displaying that possibility. And I yeah. think I had a student that had a senior recital a couple of days ago, and he's from Florida, actually, from Miami. All of his family were streaming in. That was the most convenient way, because some of them are, are elderly, so that was sure. the most convenient way for his whole family to actually attend and kind of be there. I actually got some really good recordings. I did a recording in uh, Portland, I think it was during the pandemic, where it had good mics, and it's... Sound, I could release it. You know, it sounds great. It's another way. I, I'm, I'm into it. Again, what's going to happen? <laughs> Not any, everybody can fly to London and go inside Abbey Road where they shot the zombie <laughs> thing. And I was like, wow, what a great opportunity. I think that's worth $10 or $15 of my concert ticket money. And of course, if you go to a show now, it's it's astronomical. Yeah. You cover the overhead and the insurance and the liability because of COVID cancellation. And your students, is that something they would gravitate to? I mean, I love watching live music on YouTube streaming yeah. music. And then, of course, the historical things. You know, David and I are big Miles Davis fans of the electric era there. So it's great to see Miles in Italy from 1973 and really high death. And then some of it is being enhanced by this new technological sheriff in town. And we'll talk about this since you're an engineer, artificial intelligence, AI. Oh, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> artificial. Yeah. yeah. That's and also predicated that the person who's Doing it is intelligent. intelligence at yeah. all, all artificial, you know. <laughs> Obviously, the big kerfuffle uh, last month was when the two surviving Beatles took a, a pretty mediocre John Lennon demo and gusted up with AI. They came back. Oh, really? Oh, I didn't yeah. hear that. Where have you been? Wow. <laughs> I, I, hey, in my hole, my cavern here. Now, Dana, uh, really, really is 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 obscene. Is apparently they um, there were like seventeen million downloads. And Spotify wrote them a check for 42 grand. Now, what's up with that? Whoa. The business model. That's the new business model. Yeah, so it's, it's a little off. That's not even getting a hat to pass the hat. That's like, just yeah. going like this. Man. Wow. Logic just came out with this new mastering assist, I think it's called, in their latest right. update. And I tried it out a couple of days ago and compared it to my, my own treatment <laughs> to the song. Uh, it's decent. It's just not really, it's, it's interesting. It gives you kind of a ballpark of what it might could sound like, but it, I don't think it's it's there. But fortunately, a lot of people may not have ears to tell the difference and would we'll just go for that. And I, I imagine there's going to be a lot of music, a lot of folks, unfortunately, losing their job for stuff like that. Well, there is. Yeah. You can look at AI as a replacement, but you can also look at it as an, as an enhancement. And Dave and I were discussing this with a couple of our guests. Wouldn't it be great to go back to Enrico Caruso's recordings, to how primitive they are, Charlie Parker's, and run them through mm -hmm. AI, and they mm -hmm. would sound fresh and vibrant again? Now, in the Beatles case, they put a mediocre song through AI, and it sounds mediocre. The AI couldn't take a, a, a rough John Lennon demo and turn it into a Beatles masterpiece. However... What was even more <laughs> fascinating is there are AI artists who took that song, ran it through AI, right. and did a better job than the Beatles did. They they made it sound like they were recording on the mm. Ed Sullivan show in 64. They changed the key. They brought wow. it up tempo. Uh, another AI artist made it sound as if it were uh, Strawberry Fields, that psychedelic orchestral sound. So, so the Beatles got out Beatled. <laughs> By their fan base. But yes, there is that fear that it will replace the real musician. Well, I remember jazz musicians back in the 70s who were not too friendly to me because I was a, a, a an electric bass player and the electric guitar put a horn section out of business to them. So, you know, think about it. AI goes back to the 1930s. I'm sure there were guitar players who were saying, that's not a real guitar. And you and I are old enough, David, to, to remember the invention of the DX7, right? Right, of course. <laughs> Which wreaked oh. havoc on people in drum machines. And yeah, that's, that's then, not a real... Then I thought, oh, no one's going to take a bass player's job away. You can't no. do that. Yeah, well, well. <laughs> that, is, that seems like the passage of time. That's like, I mean, yeah. the cotton gin is, is the, you know, AI. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know? I mean, when there's something new that comes on the scene... That's when there's the most resistance of that change. Yes, and then yes. eventually, you know, it comes out to that because it's like the thing. So, yeah. And then that becomes old. And then, you know, it's just a, a cyclical thing, honestly. But 
it does seem to be cycling a little faster than it did before. Well, do you think your uh, the, the schools you teach at they're obviously going to have to have AI in the curriculum? Yeah, I've already heard of one teacher that pretty embraced it over yeah. at, at MSM. I think yes. Yeah, I mean, I actually have I even know um, an English teacher that has started. It's 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 kind of again right now it's really a lot of resistance to it, but it's there's already people that are accepting it, and it's going to integrate into our creativity as Sibelius has yeah. for those who write versus. Right, right. It's a different thing, but I, I'm very thankful for Sibelius. For Sibelius. It, it's mm-hmm. my workflow is way, way, way faster <laughs> with Sibelius. <laughs> and you have to get these manuals that are like enormous to try and figure this stuff out. All right. I want to do is write. You know, and <laughs> yeah. it's almost as if there's that, how come you guys are putting all this shit in my way? <laughs> yeah. <You know>? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the problem is that you're right. The process. Yeah, can get in the way of the creativity sometimes. <laughs> but, um, well, the, the process with those kind of things is it's kind of like an instrument in itself. You got to figure out the scales, and then once you do that, then you can start expressing and be free and flow with it. But yeah. So your yeah. next live yeah. thing is with Kenny Barron, right? On the 26th. That's right. We do a week run around Christmas time every year for maybe the past, at least past decade, probably more than that. Where's it going to be? And um, the Vanguard. Village Vanguard. Okay. We got to plug, plug, and, plug. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that quintet's been playing as a quintet for probably about a decade as well. Sometimes we don't get a chance to play throughout the year. And this, some years, this is our only chance to play is that mm. week of the Vanguard. But it's always a, it's, it's the festive, you know, holiday season. And it's kind of a family reunion where you kind of get back together. And we never know what Kenny's going to call, which is always awesome. The village um, Vanguard is hallowed yeah, ground. Yeah. I mean, there's always just something, there's always a vibe there. Yeah, it's a sacred place. It's the mecca of, of jazz, I feel, in a lot of ways. Yep. All right, Dana. Well, thanks for being a guest. Yeah, and thanks we'll for having have me. This... I really appreciate it. Hey, Dana, can you give us a plug? Can you say, I'm Dana Stevens, and you're listening to Notes from an Artist? I'm Dana Stevens. You're listening to Notes from an Artist. Wow, he did that in one take, David. Wow. <laughs> I think I'm going to have to AI it, though. Yeah, we're going to have to AI that. <laughs> and Come put on. A, and put a, put a little uh, a gate on it, David. It needs a little echo. <laughs> That's it. That's and it. cowbell, of course, right? It needs more cowbell. Put it more in cowbell. a hall. Put, put it in a hall. Dana, <laughs> pleasure meeting you. All right, man. We'll see pleasure you soon. You too. We'll see you on stage. Yeah, okay. Bye-bye. Yeah, Bye-bye. Bye-bye. David, what a great conversation with Mr. Stevens. Not only a great conversation, but a lot of fun. A lot of laughing. My goodness, our guests seem to enjoy being on the show, David. What are we going to do? Uh, Well, I guess we're going to keep up what we've got to keep up. And hopefully you guys out there will subscribe both to our YouTube page. And come on, folks, download our podcasts at Apple, Buzzsprout. Where else are we potted? Uh, Everything. Wherever podcasts are potified. You've got Apple, Amazon, Buzzsprout, Spotify, and all the other ones. Listen. Yeah, I know we're on iHeart Radio as well. Go for it. We're on iHeart. We're on the YouTube podcast. We're on so we're everywhere. We are ubiquitous. It's true. <laughs> and I would get a sap to get rid of that, Tom. <laughs> yes. So please take your medication and we'll see you next week. On hey, Tom, no before you say bye bye. Yes. Guess who we got on next week? Oh, I don't know. I haven't read my uh, itinerary. We've got Mr. Joe Lynn Turner. This was a fabulous interview. You're going to really enjoy this as well as some great music. So we'll see you next week. Bye. Adios. Bye.